Hello, I'm David Donnelly, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, migrating an 8-bit design to a 32-bit design. So a couple of the things I'm going to cover are what, what are the steps you actually need to do, as well as why you might want to actually do this. And then I hope to give people a view of the overall general complexity that they would experience. So uh, one last marketing slide I do have, though, is um, as far as uh, compat upward compatibility between parts, these are the uh, Cortex instruction sets. So the green square is Cortex-M0, the blue square is the Cortex-M3, and then the, uh, the pink is the Cortex-M4, and then finally the yellow are also part of the Cortex-M4 instruction set. Those are floating point instructions. So if you, if you do have a design uh, and you do migrate it to the lowest end Cortex part, which is the M0, then you will have a, a m upward migration path among all the other ARM Cortex families, because they all include the M0 instruction set. But uh, another thing to notice from this is that the Cortex M0 instruction set is by far the simplest of all of the Cortex parts. And that is why the Cortex M0 is kind of the, the candidate. If you were looking to migrate from 8-bit to 32-bit, this is the one to start with, because it is the simplest part. So as I go through and uh, discuss each aspect of the migration, I'm going to, um, like Amit mentioned, I'm going to talk about code density, performance, power, pricing, and the migration path. So that, that sort of finished off a little bit about the migration path. I'll talk about it later when we get to tools. The first device that we're going to migrate is a can open relay driver. So this is a, it's a very simple device. It has a CAN interface on it. Um, we designed it with a PIC-18F 4585. There is a 5-volt regulator on board, and then there's also a ULM 2803 Darlington driver. So it's, um, it's a very simple device that can drive eight relays from a CAN bus. A little bit about the features of the 8-bit part that it's de we designed it with first. Um, this part we're looking at has 48K of flash, 3K of RAM, it has 1K of EEPROM, a CAN controller. Um, there's an internal RC, which for people designing CAN, the internal RC is not usually very important because it's not accurate enough to drive the CAN network, um, depending on the speed you're going. But in this case, it's 10%, so it's definitely not accurate enough. This part, um, it's a 40-pin part with 36 I.O. pins, and it it also has a 10-bit A to D, and there's um, one combined I squared C and SPI port, and there's one UART on board. So those are kind of just general purpose 8-bit microcontroller features, except for the CAN controller. Uh, and then as far as benchmarks go, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but this one runs at about 1.5 uh, iterations per second with the CoreMark benchmark. So we're going to look at migrating the design to an NXP 11C24, which is a part that has, it's a 32-bit part. A lot of the peripherals are similar. It's got 32K of flash instead of 48K of flash. Um, it has a CAN 2.0B controller. It also has a transceiver on chip. Um, the internal oscillator is 1%, which may be accurate enough to drive CAN if you're running the CAN at a lower speed. If you run it at a full one megabit, this internal oscillator is still not accurate enough. You'll need to use an external crystal. So, I mean, that, that's kind of more of a system level design thing, but a lot of times when you design things with CAN, you need to have a quarter percent accuracy in your oscillator. So, roughly the same speed megahertz wise, it's not like twice as fast or anything. Um, it also has 10-bit uh, A to D channels. It has a few more serial channels. It's got two SPIs and then a separate I squared C plus a UART. So it has four serial channels instead of two. Uh, but the main difference between this and the 8-bit the part is the performance that you can get from the CPU, which affects a lot of aspects of the system, including power. So the performance, instead of getting about 1.5 iterations per second of CoreMark, it'll do closer to 51 iterations per second. So 
some people might be asking the question, if we already have a design that works with the 8-bit part, why would we migrate to a 32-bit part? So let me just discuss a little bit about the features, the functionality that you can add to your system with the 32-bit part and also show how it doesn't impact the system design or the pricing a lot. So the first two aspects we're going to address are code density and performance. So this is a this slide compares the register map on the 8-bit part versus the 32-bit part. Um, you'll notice on the 8-bit side there's a one working register. There's if you do a multiply instead of using the working register, you'll end up using separate product registers. Um, if you want to access RAM, there's actually a bank select register to set up which section of RAM you're going to access because you can't directly access all of it. Um, if you Another way to access RAM is you can use the file select registers, which are sort of like specialized pointers that only point into RAM. Um, and then there's a table pointer to access flash. So if you compare this to the 32-bit register set, the 32-bit register set, the registers are consistently 32 bits, and they don't have the same specialized functions as on the 8-bit part. So you could access RAM with R2, or you could access RAM with R4, or you could access Flash with R4. So it's really whatever you need to access, you can just directly access it through whichever register you happen to have the pointer stored into. So one way of looking at this is that it's actually more complex to use the 8-bit architecture because you need to make sure that if you're going to do something that the value that you need is in the right register or else you won't be able to perform the operation. So there's a lot of uh, extra instructions that need to be added to move things to different registers. So I have some specific examples of you write code in C and compile it and what kind of results you get and a lot of that is because of this difference between the register sets. This is the, the first example I have which is um, it's basically copying 16-bit values uh, out of one structure into another. So two 16-bit values are copied. And as you can see, on the left-hand side, that's actually the code that is generated by the um, MPLAB C18 compiler. Um, in that case, the optimizer is turned on on both sides. And then on the right-hand side, this is code that's generated by NXP's LPC Expresso tool, which uses the free GCC compiler. Um, Many, many instructions are required. Uh, a lot of what they're doing is pointer arithmetic to access the data records because the, the addressing modes and the registers are not present in the 8-bit architecture to be able to do it directly. Because the data must be accessed 8 bits at a time, when it's copied, you have to do all the copies twice because I'm doing 16-bit uh, data operations. So, as you can see, so many more instructions are required. This has an impact both on the speed of the system operation as well as on the code size, and it also affects the power consumption because the system has to run at a higher clock speed to be able to execute all these instructions in the time that you need. Here is a, another example, which is uh, actually a 32-bit multiply. So this simple line of C code at the top, the P equals M1 star M2, generates all of this assembly code. Um, to be completely fair, the two columns of it are actually a function, so that will get reused. But the first column is actually the setup to call the multiply function, and that will be generated every time you multiply two 32-bit values together. So again, if you look at the code for the M0, there's two loads to set up for the instruction in the case that the data is not already in the registers. And then there's a single uh, one clock cycle instruction to do the multiply and then another store. So I actually forced the loads and stores by making the variables volatile. Uh, in a lot of applications, you wouldn't necessarily have those instructions because the data would already be present in registers. Um, oh, and so one other thing to point out, the, on the 8-bit side, the instructions take either four clock cycles or eight clock cycles. So there's more instructions, and then each instruction takes more clocks. On the 32-bit side, the instructions are either two, uh, one, two, or three clock cycles. 
Actually, they're either one or two. There's no three clock cycle instructions here. This is an example that is more, more in line with, uh, it's more favorable to 8-bit comparison, and it's actually setting and clearing bits of I.O. So a lot of 8-bit architectures have uh, bit set and bit clear instructions, and typically 32-bit architectures don't have that. So in this case, um, on the Cortex-M0 parts from NXP, we've added uh, bit set and bit clear uh, registers and bit masking registers, so you can do a single store or a port to set or clear bits. So it ends up with the same number of instructions to do this particular operation, which is good news. But on the other hand, the instructions still take longer to execute. The 8-bit instructions are, there is uh, two 4 clock instructions and one 8 clock instruction for this. And then on the 32-bit side, there is two 2 clock instructions and then one 3 clock instruction. So just to point out, um, the architecture of the core, why it may not seem very important, especially if you're writing code in C, could really impact the efficiency of the system. And this will affect your power consumption and the flash utilization. So one of the things that I use to demonstrate flash usage is uh, CoreMart. This is a benchmark by the Embassy Consortium that does, uh, they, they're kind of industry standard benchmarks that compile on a wide range of processors. CoreMark just focuses on the CPU core, and this is something that anybody can go and download the code and port it to a part and test it out, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to use it, because it, it is something that everybody has access to, and it's also, um, you know, it's maintained by an organization, so there's a consistent version of it that people are supposed to use. So CoreMark does linked list operations. It does uh, matrix operations, so it does 16 and 32-bit integer math on tables of numbers. It does CRC calculation and state machine control code. So um, these are pretty common programming operations, although I, I'd say on a lot of 8-bit architectures, you would want to avoid any type of linked list operations. But otherwise, these are all things that people already do on 8-bit processors. Um, they use standard C types, so sometimes they use 32-bit types and sometimes they use 16-bits. There's not, like, um, it isn't an 8-bit benchmark, so there's not a lot of work that was done to make it so that everything only uses 8-bit operations. Um, but when you're writing code, it's probably easier if you don't have to go through special work to make sure that everything you're doing is an 8-bit operation. So it's, it's just written standard programming practices. It needs about 2K of RAM. And it's self-checking, so when you run the benchmark, it tells you if it got the right answer or not, and then you know if the results are valid. So let me try to quantify what kind of performance differences a few compiler hiccups will uh, cause, like those that I showed you before. So this is um, comparing the 8-bit part that we're using in our, uh, our can-open relay driver with the 32-bit part. So the 8-bit part gets about 1.5 iterations per second through the whole CoreMark benchmark suite. And then the uh, LPC, LPC M0 11C24 um, 11, uh, 11 gets 50.8 CoreMarks per second. So this was done with the best optimization, the optimization that created the best results in both compilers. So that means it was done in the C18 compiler with all the optimization except for procedural abstraction. And then on the uh, LPC Expresso, it was done with GCC with dash OS size optimization. So um, like there's actually an optimization that you can turn on on the 8-bit part, and then you will get worse performance than this. But um, this, is, this is as good as I could get it. So what this is saying is that the the 8-bit part needs to run way, way, way much faster at a higher clock rate to achieve the same performance as the 32-bit part. Or conversely, if you're running on the 32-bit part, you can run at a lower clock rate and cut power down a lot. Looking at memory usage, uh, one big uh, cost driver in a design is how much flash memory is in the microcontroller. So the, the same benchmark code 
takes 30.6K on the 8-bit part, and it takes 8.8K on the 32-bit part. So if you're doing your design today and you're using a 48K part, which is our example part, uh, then you could definitely move down to a 32K or maybe even a 16K part if you move, move to the 32-bit part um, on this particular architecture. So I, I, it would probably depend what 8-bit part you were using. So that, that's kind of a discussion of performance and code density a little bit. Let me talk about uh, power advantages. So if you're using an 8-bit part, maybe you're using a part that's in a slightly older process running at 5 volts, um, you'll typically find that the inefficiency of the part, if you run a part at a similar clock frequency, you'll generally find it draws more power. So this 8-bit part draws 23 milliamps, uh, that's data sheet typical current, and that's running at 40 megahertz. And the 11C24, when running at 48 megahertz, the typical is 7 milliamps. So you save 70% of the current, and you haven't even started optimizing it or using any sleep modes or anything like that. So partially this is because the uh, a lot of the 32-bit parts are done in newer processes, so that they're just more efficient. And then part of it is because there's a lot of design work that NXP puts in, in uh, as far as power management. Uh, for clock gating peripherals and stuff like that to save power. So deep power down current is also lower. Um, on the uh, 11C24, the deep power down is 22 milliamps, where it is on the, this PIC 18 4585, it's 0 .22 microamps, whereas it's 0.5 microamps on the PIC 18. There's an additional mode, deep sleep, that the NXP part has at the uh, 8-bit part does not have, so there's more options in the system design. As you can see, run power at maximum speed is much less. Given the increase in performance, the speed could be reduced further, so instead of running off of the PLL, um, maybe you could run directly off the crystal, and then you could also reduce the amount of time spent in run mode and spend more time in sleep mode, and the overall system power consumption could be reduced immensely. So to do the actual migration, the first thing we have to do is the 8-bit the part that we were using is a 5-volt part, and the 11C24 is a 3.3-volt uh, core part. So we needed to add a, an additional regulator to the design. Um, in this case, we chose a regulator from a SOT23 package. It's, it's very, very small, and the cost is low and we added it to our design. So this is actually the new schematic for the 32-bit design. There's not a huge difference from, aside from this additional regulator. Um, sometimes people think, oh, if I move from 8-bit to 32-bit, I'll have to you know, completely restructure the way the system is architected and there will be a lot of work. But it, it's, it's a mainly in just an effort of a lot of our 32-bit micros, are, they're very embedded. They include their own reset controllers and regulators internally. So there's not a lot of extra that has to be done in the design. One thing that has to be done is the, the pins, the pinout changes on the part. So the, the Darlington drivers, which are connected to port D on the PIC design, we ended up moving them on the uh, LPC 11 C24 we moved them over to port two. So in addition to moving the Darlington drivers, we're able to remove the CAN transceiver because this 32-bit part has a CAN transceiver built in. The PC board that we had, um, we had to relay it out because the new micro is in a different package. But you know the, the overall dimensions of it didn't end up changing and there's there's not it's not like a designing from scratch kind of effort to make this change. There's a little bit of board space that is saved because the, the package that we're using in the 11C24 is smaller than the, uh, the, the QFP package that with the PIC-18 was in. So now this is actually one of the bigger parts of the migration that I'll talk about, which is the software migration task. So 
One of the things that really helps with this is the libraries that NXP provides. So uh, probably if you're new to 32-bit processors and you haven't used any of the development tools, one development tool you would consider would be LPC Expresso. LPC Expresso is an Eclipse-based IDE, and it also is a, refers to a set of development boards that uh, work with NXP processors. So the, the entire thing together is called LPC Expresso. Some of the features of LPC Expresso are that it's free. Um, it's a free IDE. The, it includes a GCC compiler with optimization that doesn't expire. Um, there's project templates for all of the NXP ARM parts. So if you create a new project, you can pick the part and then you'll get a, you'll get a simple template project that you can compile and download immediately. Um, also included with LPC Expresso are census libraries and C libraries. So the census libraries are the processor header files, um, and then the C library uh, implements things like printf or scanf, which those can also be run in LPC Expresso. So the, there is an external debugger that you can use, or you can actually use the LPC link debugger that comes in the LPC Expresso board. So out of the box, the, the tools are kind of all bundled together for LPC Expresso. You can run this IDE under Windows and Linux. And it supports pretty much all of the, uh, the NXP LPC parts. The LPC Expresso board, if, I don't know if anyone has seen one at our booth, but it, it's two halves. One half is actually a debugger, and the other half is a target board. So the debugger board can be separated from the target and used to debug your own uh, design and not used directly with the target. So the, the combination of the LPC link debugger and the uh, target board together is $29. There's many other development tools that are available for uh, NXP's 32-bit micros that you could also look at. Uh, and many of these vendors are here at the show. But some very popular ones are uh, Kyle and IAR and Hitex. So, they have uh, IDEs as well, and they, they have uh, features like C++ compilers and, and so forth that aren't in the free tool. Or you could go to Code Red, who is, they're the writers of LPC Expresso, and they have the Red Suite, which has additional uh, features beyond LPC Expresso. The basic free LPC Expresso tool has a 128K uh, flash code size limit. But other than that, it's fairly unrestricted for, for a free tool. Uh, other tools available are Embed. Embed is a tool where the, the IDE is online, and when you hit compile, it actually sends you a binary that you download and you save onto the Embed board. And the Embed board, uh, it plugs into USB and it acts like a disk drive, so when you save the binary on it, it will actually get programmed into the flash of the part, and then you can run your code that way. But there's no debugger support for Embed. So the upside is you don't have to install any software. It's really easy to use. And then the downside is, well, you can't debug your code. You can print F or log things to file, but you don't have the traditional step and breakpoint. So again, with migration path, another thing that helps with uh, NXP's uh, tool strategy is there's so many third-party vendors that make tools for the NXP 32-bit parts that if you're already using a vendor today, you might find that um, the same vendor who's making your 8-bit tools also makes tools for NXP 32-bit parts. And that happens in our second migration example. So again, back to doing the software for the migration. So the key thing is always remember to use the NXP libraries and sample code. Um, this is actually a list of sample code that we have for the 11C24. Um, there's, there's simple examples that show how to use the ADC, the GPIO, the CAN. Um, there's an on-chip CAN driver in ROM, and so we have an example that shows how to use the CAN driver that's in ROM. There's also a free RTOS port. There's uh, demos of how to use the PWM. Uh, so it goes, it goes on for a while. So again, if you start with our, our code, that will make it a lot easier. You won't have to recreate the wheels so much when you're porting your 8-bit project. So 
Speaking of libraries and ROM, uh, NXP has a number of different types of ROM libraries today. Uh, one of the ones that uh, Emmett mentioned was the Power Profiles. Mm -hmm. So Power Profile is an API for dynamic current management at runtime. What that means is that you call this API and you say, I only want to run the part at 12 megahertz, and that's all I need. Then it will go out and configure the chip. It does uh, multiple different things to the part. It reconfigures the memory settings as well as it configures the core voltage inside of the chip uh, to reduce the run current if you don't need the full performance of the part. But if you do need the full performance, then you can call this API and you can say put it in performance mode. Uh, the run current will go up and you will be able to get uh, faster performance on benchmarks or whatever. So, well, I mean, whatever your design is, presumably the actual design is not, not to run benchmarks. So another uh, ROM library that's handy is there is a ROM divide function that we have in the LPC 1200. So one of the things missing from Cortex-M0 versus Cortex-M3 and M4 is a hardware divide uh, instruction. So a lot of all the compiler vendors implement a hardware divide and it runs at different speeds, but we have the fastest hardware divide and we put it in ROM on the LPC 1200 and you can actually, we have example code that shows how when you're doing divides you can have the compiler use the ROM divider instead of its own divider and you'll, you'll get better performance. Uh, also our divider has uh, consistent uh, performance so that at uh, Depending on the numbers that you divide, sometimes software divide routines take different amounts of time, whereas ours has a consistent runtime, which can help make your system uh, easier to debug if it's real time. So other features in ROM include a can open driver. So this particular uh, part that the migration is focused on, which is the uh, LPC 11C24, that has a can interface on it. It also has uh, CAN drivers and CAN open drivers that are in ROM. So there's a couple of things that that does that really help out in the system. And besides making it faster to write your code, it can save you space in flash, again, making it so that you don't need the part that has you know 32K of flash. We also have USB drivers in the uh, LPC 1300 family that has USB. So the CAN open drivers that are built into the uh, LPC 11 C24. Uh, it's an easy to use API. Um, it's it's kind of pretty much plug and play. Uh, the, we have some example code. It's very short for sending and receiving CAN frames. Um, for, uh, for CAN open, you can define your dictionaries and so forth, and then uh, let our API manage the sending and receiving of the frames. We also have a, a CAN bootloader that comes on the part in ROM. So if you have a part that's unprogrammed, you can put it on a board and then program it through CAN without having to download any code to it first. The drivers in ROM also save operating power because ROM draws a little bit less power than flash memory. So anyway, if we do this design and we, um, we reroute our board, and we change our code, what we'll end up with, uh, in addition to lots of performance headroom for new features, is uh, cost savings. So the, this older part that we were looking at, it's uh, about $5.70, and the new um, LPC 11C24 is about three eighteen. So these are sort of estimated, um, estimated 1K prices. So, so we end up saving about $3, even though we had to add a regulator, because the regulator is only 13 cents. So that's the last uh, bubble on this chart, which is pricing. So there's actually, in some cases, there's a pricing advantage if you use a newer 32-bit part versus you using continuing to produce a design that has like an older 8-bit part in it. So now let me talk about the next example, which is migrating from an 8051, which is, this is based on a battery charger example, which is an NXP application node. So the application node is uh, AN10338, which is available to everybody on the NXP website. 
and it implements a single, uh, simple buck converter lithium ion battery charger. Um, this design, uh, here's the schematic for it, it takes an input of about five volts and then it'll charge a, a single cell 700 to 750 milliamp hour uh, lithium ion battery. So when we do this design, we don't actually have a large cost savings because the 32-bit part that we're looking at is the 1111. This is the 65 cent part versus the pricing on the 8051 is about 69 cents. However, if you look at the, the features that are available in the part, it would allow anyone doing this design to add many more features into the same design without having to add any, um, add a, like another microcontroller. So for instance, we start out with 2K of flash and then the 32-bit part is 8K of flash for you know, four cents less. Um, go from 256 bytes of RAM to 4K of RAM. Um, a to D converter performance is increased from 8-bit to 10-bit. So this allows us to get more accurate voltage readings and current readings when we're doing our charging. Um, because the 32-bit part runs at a higher clock speed, we're able to run the PWM at a faster rate. And the faster rate of the PWM could allow you to use a smaller size inductor and save costs that way. Performance-wise, um, instead of running at 7 megahertz, we can actually run all the way up to 48 megahertz because um, there's a built-in PLL on the 32-bit part. And then finally, there's a lot more I.O. pins that are available. So those I.O. pins could be used to add new features, such as instead of just being a battery charger, it could be you know a whole iPad, uh, iPod uh, speaker system with transport controls and a display, and uh, just because of all the additional micro-resources that are available. So this is a block diagram of the 8051 part we used in the app node. So to, to do the migration, um, basically what we have to do is change the microcontroller out on the schematic and relay out the board. Um, we didn't have the original design, so we had to lay out the board from scratch. Um, since the old part has a 3.3 volt power supply, we did not have to add another regulator for this design. And then finally, we need to migrate the code using the libraries. In this case, the old design used the Kyle development tools for the 8051, and Kyle also produces development tools for ARM Cortex parts. Um, so we're able to use the same development tool, which helps a lot in porting the software. This slide shows the kind of some of the code modules that you would add in. You'd create a new project and add these in to get started. Um, the core underscore cm0.c, startup underscore lpc11xx.s, and uh, system underscore lpc11xx.c, these are standard uh, code files that are added to pretty much every 32-bit uh, LPC project, and they, they come distributed with the compiler. Um, usually, if not, we have a code bundle you can download if your compiler doesn't have it. Uh, we need the timer driver and also the ADC to uh, do our battery charger, so we would just add this stuff into the project. And then we'd need to fill out the logic where we uh, you know, manage the state of charge and stuff like that. But since it was written in C, um, it shouldn't be that hard to port it once you get the hardware layer done, which we have available in the form of example code. That's it. I guess, I guess that's it for today. Thank you all for coming. Thanks.